All right, so now that we've taken a look at the method of integrating by substitution, and we've looked at the three main types that you're going to be seeing where you're using this to work backwards in the chain rule. Uh, we looked at a type where you had to recognize that the derivative in the integrand is something that was as a result of the chain rule with the product rule and working backwards. Uh, we looked at um, integrals where the integrand itself was the result of chain rule and because you were taking the derivative of a log so that would mean that we were using the log rule for integration and then we looked at the third type which is those uh, that are as a result of taking the derivative of an inverse trig function so you would need to use the inverse trig rules for integrating so now what we're going to do is we're basically going to look at some more complex integrals that we're going to be doing that are using the skills you have so far but may require a little bit of algebra uh, from your Algebra 2 classes to help you maybe alter the integrand into one of the ones that we've looked at as our options. Uh, so this is this idea of kind of going back, it's kind of bringing everything together. So these are going to be challenging mostly because it's not just recognizing that you have used the chain rule with the power rule, the log rule, or the inverse trig rule. You have to also recognize that there's some algebra that you're going to have to use to alter the integrand into something that looks like one of the forms that we are going to, that we've already discussed in chapter five. Um, one of the options that you're going to have taking a look at it is like as this joke is that sometimes like parents of fighting siblings you need to send each kid to his own room. So let's take a look at example 17 and what we notice here in example 17 that this appears to be similar to a power rule um, integration because I can let my u equal my 4 minus x squared and then when I go to look at my du, it's going to be minus 2x. And so initially, you would be, oh, hey, I've got an x in the top, and so that would be the derivative. The problem is this little extra plus 2. And the idea is that that really shouldn't bother us so much. One of our algebra techniques is to recognize that I can split a fraction over addition. I can pull it apart using a common denominator. So I'm going to rewrite this as x over the square root of 4 minus x squared dx plus the integral of 2 over the square root of 4 minus x squared dx. And so by sending each kid to his room, that what's going to happen here is that's going to allow us to use on this one a power rule for our integration. And then over here, because notice there's no x in the top, this one is going to be an inverse trig rule for our integration. So we can always separate. So your algebra technique number one is if you have too much stuff in the numerator, part which might be related to the derivative of u and then a constant, just split them up and we'll use the separate rules individually for each one. So for this one, I'm going to use the u substitution that I've highlighted here. I'm going to add in my missing negative 2 and put my correction in. So now I can go ahead and integrate. I'm going to uh, leave this as negative 1 half, the integral of du over square root of u, which again, because this is power rule, it might be better to write this as u to the negative 1 half du as we go to integrate this one. Uh, I'll do the plus and I'll fill this in in a second. I like to kind of do my parts as I go all along. So the antiderivative of u to the negative one half would be add one to our power and then divide by one half which is multiplying by two and then multiply by the constant that we're bringing along for our correction. Now don't do plus c because we'll just stick that over here at the end. You know it's kind of like one of those things that when you do this integration each of these is going to have its own plus a constant but because we're just doing general antiderivatives we're just going to stick over at the very end plus c and it'll take care of the constant for both of these. All right and then at the very end of course I got to go back from u to my original so I would have well, we might as well simplify while we're here 
negative one half of two is simply going to be negative and then my u to the one half so we would do our four minus x squared to the one half so I kind of do this part by itself and then I come over to the next part and with this is my inverse trig rule and remember that I have an a here so on this one I'm letting a equal two and so this derivative if we remind ourselves what we did in a previous video so I'll slide back to the previous page is that if I'm taking the antiderivative let's see I think I wrote it on our paper here somewhere uh, that was the inverse secant one uh, right here so if I have the antiderivative of an a squared and we have what square root of I forgot what the form was let's take a look at it um, a number minus x squared a number minus x squared so if I have the square root of a number minus x squared that's in our inverse sine rule and so I'm pretty much going to be doing arc sine of x over a plus c so using our rule from the previous page we're going to immediately go arc sine x over a is 2 and then of course plus c and then I'm just going to bring it along with me to fill out the remaining steps the extra steps I had from the first part and then we're done with that problem so to evaluate this we have to split it apart we have to recognize that we can algebraically separate the numerator of the fraction into two parts use the power rule when you have the x in the top use the inverse trig rule when we have a constant in the top all right so now in example 18 I'm actually going to let you play around with these now kind of the thing is recognizing what rule we're going to use whether you're going to use the power rule the log rule or the inverse trig rule for integration and of these three two of them you can do and one of them you cannot do and so I want you to kind of look at these identify which rule is being used and identify which one you think is one that you do not have a rule to use that's not a log rule not an inverse trig rule and not a power rule so I'm going to give you pause the video, take a look at these, work the ones that you think you can work, the two out of the three, and then after you've done that and you think you've identified the one you cannot work and you've worked the two, then turn the video back on and I'll show you the answers. All right, so if we take a look at the first one, we look at this and we're trying to figure out what rule we're going to go into. Now notice in this one, I looked at what I had underneath of the radical and if I were to let u equal 5x to the fourth then the derivative of u would have an x cubed in it and since I have an x cubed in the top then I meet the requirement that I can use this u substitution and my derivative of u is for the most part in the numerator and all I have to do is put in a correction for the missing constant so I pull the writer 3 out I put in my missing constant and correct for it out here so then I am basically looking at a derivative of the form negative three-fourths and then this is du over square root of u so I rewrote it as u to the negative one-half du I use the power rule to integrate it and I just went ahead and plugged my u back in so in this problem you can use the power rule in it and the reason that I know its power rule is because when I look at what is under the radical right here its derivative was up here in the top now let's come over here to C because this is the other one that you can work this is an inverse trig rule now what bothers you here is probably that you have this extra X up here but remember you can do a U substitution I wouldn't let the U equal the whole thing like I did over here because that would require an X cubed in the top so then I start looking at it going well maybe this is an inverse trig rule maybe the inverse sine so I try to get it to be a number minus u squared so you'll notice here that I have taken my x to the fourth and rewritten it as x squared squared again how did I know to do that I first checked to see if it was power rule and saw that it wasn't going to work so then I start going sort of looks like an inverse sine trig rule so now I'm going to break this into the see if I can get it as 5 minus u squared so I do that and when I do this and I take its derivative its derivative is 2x dx and there I have the derivative of u in the numerator like I like necessary the only thing I was missing was the 2 
I pulled the writer 3 out, put in the constant and its correction. So I can put this back into the correct form for my inverse trig rule with my inverse sign. The difference being that you're going to have an A here. So remember that I'm kind of, as I see this form go, I'm going to be using A equal to the square root of that number. So I use A equal to square root of 5. And then I use my bring your constants along, inverse sign, your U over your A plus C. And so my U is X squared, my A is square root of 5, and then I have filled in my inverse trig. All right, so now let's take a look at my second version here and kind of why I eliminated and said that this is not going to be a power rule, a log rule, or an inverse trig rule. So again, starting out, I would initially look at the 5 minus x to the fourth as a u substitution. And I realized that its derivative would be x cubed, and I have a problem because it's x squared. Then I would look at it in terms of trying to make it inverse trig. And so I try to make it a number minus u squared. So I would do what I did over here. And then I recognize, well, the derivative of x squared is going to be 2x. I would need an x in the top. And again, I have this square in there that's going to mess up the problem. And then I guess technically the third one would be to make u the entire denominator to be trying to get it in the form of if I were going to do the log rule, du over u and what I see is by doing this substitution hopefully you can see that clearly the derivative of this is going to have a square root it's gonna be like one half the square root of this or this to the negative one half times 4x cubed that was way complicated that there's no way that you're gonna make the u substitution equal to the entire denominator so it is not a log rule either so once you eliminate the power the log or the inverse trig rule this is something that you, at this moment in time, do not have the ability to integrate. That's not saying that next year, when you're taking Math 201, that they will look at other strategies for integrating things of this type. But your job is right now is to recognize that you cannot do this and why you can't do it. Your job in the AP curriculum is to make sure you understand how to use U substitution with a power rule, a log rule, or an inverse trig rule. All right. Now let's take a look at some things that initially, so we're coming now down to some more strategies, some alternative strategies, some algebraic strategies, algebraic strategies, where when we initially first look at a problem that is a fraction that we think, oh that doesn't look like any of the ones that we have, but we're going to be able to algebraically manipulate it and turn it into an integration that we can do. Right? The first strategy that we want to look at is to see what happens when we factor. Okay? So like when I see this right here, I'm going to recognize that that itself is a perfect square. So one of the things that you're going to do is, is to look at a fraction and initially you would say let's try to let u equal x squared plus 6x plus 9. Kind of going for my log rule, let the whole denominator be the u. But the problem with this is going to be that the derivative of u is 2x plus 6. And if I look at the top, what I actually have in the top, there is in no way um, a derivative form that's going to have the 2x plus 6 in it. So I go, all right, so this log rule choice is not going to work. So uh, one of the strategies is to say, well, can I factor it? Okay, because it doesn't look like any of the other one, doesn't look like an inverse trig rule, because it's not x squared plus a number down there, and there's no square root of x squared minus a number or a number minus x squared, which is going to be my inverse trig rules. So I go, well, let's see, this factors really nicely. So I'm going to rewrite this as 3, and this, of course, is x plus 3 squared. Now, when I do this, I do this algebraic manipulation of factoring, and then I take a look at what I have. Now let's try to let u equal x plus 3. And when u is x plus 3, its derivative is simply going to be 1 dx. So I just need a constant in the top. And oh, look, I have a constant in the top. So I can perform this. This is really a writer. So I'm going to pull the 3 out. And then I have my 1 dx that I need for the du. 
and then this is going to be my u squared. So I can rewrite this into the form of where I go 3 times the integral of 1 over u squared or u to the negative 2 du. Then I can integrate it using the power rule 3 u to the add 1 negative 1 divide by our power so basically we're going to multiply by negative 1 plus c and then we can put back in our u so we have negative 3 over x plus 3 plus c. Okay, so the trick here was to recognize that we couldn't do a u substitution as it stood here, that it was not going to work. But if it's in a section in your book or you're being asked to do it on the AP, it has to be something that you actually can integrate. So if it's not directly one of the forms that gives you the log rule, the power rule, or the inverse trig rule, your job is to manipulate it algebraically to turn it into one of those three substitution rules that we're using. Okay? And factoring is our first option to take a look at. All right, now taking a look at three, okay, it's the same kind of a problem. I try to let the u equal the entire denominator, trying to think of this as a log rule problem, but it's not going to work because I don't have my derivative in the top. And again, it's not an inverse tangent because it's x squared and it's got this plus 6x here. So I initially try the factoring rule, okay? And, and one of the things that you kind of have to think about when we are integrating and it starts to get complicated like this, it's like a puzzle. We have several options and we're going to evaluate and discard different options until we find the one that's going to work. So it's more of a process of elimination. I would look at this and say, can I do a u substitution, make the entire denominator u, and uh, work this problem using a power rule? And the answer in this case is going to be, uh, or using a log rule, because I'm going to have something over u, and that doesn't work. And then I go, all right, well, let's factor. That was the other thing. I, I say, okay, let's try to factor. I know it's not inverse trig because of the 6x, and if I try to factor this. And let's see, do we have any factors of 10 that are going to add to 6? Factors of 10 that add to 6. And we might see, no, I don't really have any factors here, so it doesn't really factor. So now the question becomes, what do I do? Because it can't be a u substitution right yet, and it doesn't factor. So then I start thinking about my Algebra 2 skills and try to find out something that might help me get it into a nice factored form. Maybe because, you know, one of your inverse trig choices is basically going to be um, to get it into, if I could get it into something over a squared plus u squared, then that might be, you know, the sum of two perfect squares would be great. And so I think, was well, there any way I can get it into the sum of perfect squares? It would be really nice if I had perfect squares to add together. And then I go, oh, wait a minute. You remember our process of completing the square? So we're going to complete the square. Because if I were to complete the square on this, I should end up with a perfect square plus a number. And then that kind of le lends itself to my inverse tangent rule that we're looking at. So remember you're completing the square process. You're required to have a 1 in front of the x squared. I'm going to go plus blank. And then I have plus 10. And then because I'm doing this all in one part of a fraction, I am going to whatever I add here to complete the square on the x's, I am going to need to subtract over here to balance it out. Because I don't want to change it. I just want to manipulate it algebraically into a nicer form. So we think about our completing the square process, which is take your middle term, divide it by 2, which is 3. 3 squared is 9. So I can make this a perfect square. And if I add 9, I have to subtract 9 to keep it so that it is the same thing I started with. Now what that does for me is now I have 3 over a perfect square, x plus 3 squared, plus 1 dx. And then we think about our rules that we have. Is this going to be a power rule? No. But I could do a u substitution here. If I were to let u 
equal x plus 3, then my du would be dx. And so this constant's nothing more than a writer. I'm going to pull it out. And I'm going to end up with basically du over u squared plus 1, which is my inverse tangent rule. And so now I can perform the integration using the inverse tangent rule. So inverse tangent of u, I'm going to go ahead and put that back in, plus c. And so we were able to do the problem. I had to manipulate it algebraically, and the way that we manipulated it algebraically was to complete the square. Complete the square. All right, let's take a look at part c. And so for part C, we are going to go through that same process of elimination. Like I said, we know that we have a limited number of tools to integrate. So I am going to see and look for one of the tools and see which one works. It's almost like a guess and check method. And the more you do, the easier it is to figure out which technique we're going to use. All right, so now on this one, I take a look at this and I realize that this is not going to be a u substitution for the entire thing because I don't have its derivative up in the top, so it's not a log rule. I then try to factor it so that I got a perfect square and I go, oh, it doesn't factor, like this one did, this one factored to a perfect square that I could then do a u substitution on. So then I'm like, okay, it does factor. I mean, kind of looking at it, it wouldn't be incorrect to go, well, this does factor to x plus 2 and x plus 4. The problem with this is is that you can't let, you don't have two different u's, okay? So it doesn't really work the factoring process for me. It doesn't give me something nice like what I had over here in A. So then we say, all right, well let's try instead of this, let's try to complete the square. And so again, let's do our 3 and we have our x squared plus 6x plus blank plus 8 minus blank dx because we're going to complete the square and since we just did this one we know that we're going to add 9 and subtract 9 and then we get to here and we take a look at this one and we end up with 3 over x plus 3 squared minus 1 dx and then we start going no now wait a minute this is not an inverse tangent rule because to be inverse tangent, it's got to be u squared plus a number. And we don't have that. We have a subtraction. Um, it can't be the inverse sine because that needs a square root over it. And, and then so actually, we failed in both things. This one's going to require a new algebraic technique. Called partial fractions partial fractions. Now I am going to say that this is typically a BC topic. I'm going to show it to you on this one just to kind of give you an idea of what you could do. But for the AB, uh, this will be something that we'll probably do after the AP test because it's great, it's a nice technique, but it's not something that's going to come up actually on the AP. But just to be thorough, I'm going to show you this algebra technique. Okay, so what we're going to do here, I'm going to come back to this one right here. You're actually going to use the factored form. And I'm going to come down here, give myself a little bit more room down here. And I'm just going to start working it over here. So I'm going to take the integral, which had the 3 over x plus 2, x plus 4 dx. And partial fractions is kind of a technique where what you're trying to do is you're trying to work backwards from your two factors that you have here. You can kind of think of this as a common denominator. That you could have had a two fractions that you were adding together that had this as a common denominator. But you could, you're trying to like split the fraction back up so that one fraction would have a denominator of x plus 2 and the other fraction is going to have a denominator of x plus 4. And what we want to happen when we split this into its partial fractions, this idea that we can uncommon denominator it, and, and I need to change this because these will not be the same numerators. Your job when you split this into the partial fractions, here are my partial fractions, 
is going to be that I need to find A and B so that after getting a common denominator, so that after getting a common denominator, the numerator equals the 3 from over here. Now let's think about how we would get a common denominator. To get a common denominator, if I had these partial fractions, what I would do is I would have to multiply this by the fraction, a form of 1, x plus 4 over x plus 4, and I would have to multiply this one by x plus 2 over x plus 2, right? So just kind of thinking that if I had the partial fractions, to put it into a common denominator, I would multiply by a form of 1. And then after you have put it into so that everything has a common denominator, what you actually do to get your numerator is you add the tops. And so what you're going to do is you're going to create a formula which says that your a times x plus 4 plus your b times x plus 2 has to end up equaling the numerator over here, which is really going to be 0x plus 3. Okay. And notice that if I multiply this out, I'm going to get ax plus 4a plus bx plus 2b, which is going to, I'm going to group the x's together. So I have a plus b of the x's plus 4a plus 2b. And the way that this works is that when you have a constant here, that these must have been constants over here. So what we can do, it's almost like a matching game. If we know that this is equal to 0x plus 3, the result, then a plus b has to be 0, and 4a plus 2b has to equal 3. I am creating a system of equations. So I can solve the system by substitution or elimination. It doesn't really matter what your choice is. Uh, let's do it by elimination. So you can see how I'm reviewing a lot of algebra topics here. I'm going to multiply this by negative 4. And then I'm going to add it to the second part of the system. So negative 4a plus 4a, those would cancel and give me 0a. Then I have negative 4b plus 2b, or negative 2b, equals 0 plus 3, which is 3. So negative 2b equals 3, so b would be negative 3 halves. So I have figured out the constant, negative 3 halves. Once I have b, I can find a, because they add to 0, a would have to be 3 halves. So what we've managed to do is to take this combined fraction together and I can now split it to be the constant 3 halves over x plus 2 dx plus the integral of negative 3 halves over x plus 4 dx. And now I have turned it into two integrals that you can do. And I will leave these for you to finish from here. Uh, like I said, this process, don't worry so much about this for the AP. We will come back to this one after the AP. This is not on the AB portion of the AP exam. I just wanted to mention it for thoroughness, and we will come back and we will discuss this more after the AP. Okay, just kind of giving you a heads up of some coming attractions for the remaining topics um, after the AP test. Right? But I do want you to go ahead and finish this problem out because now these are integrals that you can use a U substitution on. So go ahead and finish the problem from here. All right, so now let's take a look at a couple more problems. Um, and this is really where we're starting to get into some of the applications. I mean, essentially, we have really done all the techniques that we are going to do. Uh, we have one more algebra technique that I'll show you down at the bottom of this page. But then we're just basically going to have applications of integration. And obviously, from our discussions that we've had earlier, one of the main applications is the area of a region. 
So we're going to do one example just to kind of preview that uh, before we go on to our last algebraic technique that we're going to show you below. So we're going to find the area of a region that's bounded by this graph, the x-axis, and the lines x equal to 3 halves and x equal to 9 fourths, and we're going to verify it on our calculator. Now, kind of one of the things to think about with this is to first realize that this is a positive function for always, because when it's defined, the square root is positive, so this is always positive. So the area under f of x is going to be the area. So the definite integral is going to be area. Okay, so that I want to keep in mind. And so, and it doesn't even really matter what this function actually looks like. Once I recognize that f of x is greater than 0 for all x in the domain, okay, there may be a domain on this. Uh, we can think about that in a second. But that for this, to find the area of the region, then if I start at 3 halves and I go up to 9 fourths, wherever that function is, it's going to be above. And so it doesn't even matter where it is because I'm going to be able to then calculate this area by setting up a definite integral. All right? So the area between f and the x-axis from the interval 3 halves to 9 fourths can be found by doing the definite integral from 3 halves to 9 fourths, again because the function was always positive, by putting in your function, your f of x, so we'll do 1 over square root 3x minus x squared dx, and that would be it. We're done. We just have to calculate this integration. So now we have to figure out what technique we want to use for this. So take a moment and take a look at the form of this and let's see if we can figure out what u substitution we're going to use or what we might need to do on this. Do you think we might need to use one of those algebra techniques, maybe factoring or completing the square that we were talking about in the previous section? So take a moment, pause the video, and think what might be a good selection here. All right, now some of the kind of what should be going through your head right now as you are looking at this is when you see that you have this square root down here, okay? Again, the first thing I try to do is I try to make you the entire radicand underneath. But if I did that, then I would have basically a derivative of negative 2x plus 3, and I don't have anything up here. So I know that that u substitution, this is not going to be a power rule problem. And then I look at it and I think, well, it's got that square root in it. And it's not going to do you any good to let u equal the entire square root, because obviously I have nothing up here to be the derivative. So then I start going, well, possibly let's head toward an inverse trig. But to, to make this an inverse trig, I really need to have u squared plus a number, or u squared minus a number, numbers minus u squared. I'm, I'm going for inverse sine or inverse secant on this. So our technique that we are going to use on this is going to be we are going to take what's under here and we are going to complete the square. You will see that this complete the square technique because a lot of our forms that we can integrate are the sums or differences of perfect squares that completing the square is going to be a very handy technique. Now you do have to remember that when you complete the square that you have to have a coefficient of 1 on your squared term. So the first thing I'm going to do in my process is I am going to factor out the negative and then I'm going to write it as x squared minus 3x. Okay. So I'm going to do that. I'm just going to extend this out because I need to have a little bit of more room there. And I'm going to leave some space because I'm going to complete the square in here. And then I'm also going to, now be careful here, if I complete the square in here, I'm going to add something, but it's multiplied times that negative. So really you're subtracting something, so you're going to need to add something back in. So this is just reviewing your completing the square process. So to complete the square, I take the middle term, I divide it by 2, which is going to give me 3 halves. 3 halves squared is going to give me 9 fourths. So I'm really subtracting 
9 fourths because of the negative out here, so I add 9 fourths to balance it. Now I'm going to factor this and write it as a perfect square. So my integral now becomes 3 halves, 2 9 fourths, 1 over square root of negative. Go ahead and factor this. This would be x minus 3 halves squared plus 9 fourths. Okay, and then I'm continuing along here, bringing my definite integral. 3 halves to 9 fourths. And I'm going to just put this in a better order and don't lose your dx as you go. Because I have basically square root of a number minus u squared, x minus 3 halves squared, a number minus u squared. So if we look back, again just reminding us of our uh, inverse trig, if I have the square root of a number minus u squared, that's an inverse sine problem. So I need to identify a, I need to identify my u, and work the problem with that. Oops, so I need to go two pages over. All right, so now taking a look at this, I'm going to let my u be the x minus 3 halves. My du would be dx. All right, so I'm good here. I'm not missing any constants that I need to put in as a correction. So I can change this. Okay, now I'm going to pause for a second. I'm going to highlight these uh, bounds because we need to talk about this. But I'm going to change this to u. So it becomes 1 over the square root of 9 fourths minus u squared du. Okay, I'm going to take care of these bounds in just a second. Now, when I go to integrate this then, what I basically know is that a is 3 halves, and I'm using the u, which is x minus 3 halves, okay, and then I'm going to integrate this using the inverse sine. So it would be arc sine of my u, x minus 3 halves, over a divided by 3 halves plus, now originally if this had been an indefinite integral, we would have done plus c here. But what we need to recognize is that we're not doing an indefinite integral, so we're not going to do the plus c. We are using this as a net change. Notice that I'm not doing anything different. I need to evaluate this from an x of 3 halves up to 9 fourths. Now, partly why I'm waving my hands a little bit, we're going to do a whole section on definite integrals where you have to do your u substitution. But notice that I kind of waffled a little bit here. I technically have bad communication because if I am doing a definite integral, I also have to have bounds here and here. I have to recognize I have bounds. Now, those bounds, however, this is one of the tricks to the trade, that if I'm going to switch to u, it has to be bounds that are u's. So technically, if x is 3 halves, u would be 0. And when x is 9 fourths, u would be 9 fourths minus 6 fourths or 3 fourths. So technically, to be correct, I would have to fill the bounds in, and they would have to be bounds of u. But notice that because I went back to my x, that I then switched back to the x values to plug in. But notice that you could do this problem. Instead of switching back to x, we can do arc sine of u over 3 halves and evaluate that from 0 to 3 fourths and calculate our net change using the u. You will get the same answer both ways. It's more of a communication issue. You might have been able, some people ignore this step and go straight from here to here and then evaluate the definite integral with x's. They just kind of use the u to get the right form, but they stay in x's. If you switch to u's, you have to switch your bounds. You can switch back to x's, or you can stay in u when you are doing a definite integral. Okay? And like I said, we'll do more uh, examples of this uh, in the next section. I just wanted to kind of preview some minor differences that might happen because you have a definite integral here. 
All right, and then so we we'll go ahead and evaluate it because we're actually trying to find the area, and that is going to find an actual value. So I can plug in the 9 fourths minus my 3 halves, which guess what? It's going to give me 3 fourths. 3 fourths divided by 3 halves would be 3 fourths times 2 thirds, which is going to give me arc sine of a half minus. If you were to plug in 3 halves, you would get arc sine of 0, or if you would plug in 0, arc sine of 0, and then we simply have to go, what's the angle whose sine is 1 half, pi over 6, and the angle whose sine is 0 is 0, so our final answer is the area between the curve and the x-axis is pi over 6. So this is an example, and again, where we're trying to bring everything together. An application of definite integrals is finding the area of the region. When the function is positive, the area under the function between that and the x-axis is the definite integral. We had to complete the square. We had to do some algebraic manipulation on this one to get it into a form that we could then integrate. And then the definite integral part really just adds a little bit of a layer that you find the antiderivative using the fundamental theorem of calculus, and we want to calculate our net change. The only rule with the bounds is that if you change to u, you have to change your bounds to u. And if you don't change to u, you can keep them as x. And so you kind of can go here, here, and then down to this one. Or you can go here, keep them in x, and go to there. But if you switch your variable by doing a u substitution, then you have to change your bounds. All right? And like I said, we'll do more practice on this um, in the next set of notes. Now there's one more algebraic technique that I want to kind of work on in this section of the notes to kind of finish out. And this algebraic technique has to do with division. And you remember we had our uh, long division of polynomials? So long division of polynomials is going to be another algebraic technique that we're going to use when the fraction that we're given is not in a form that is going to be useful for our log rule, our inverse trig rule, or our power rule, and that completing the square on the denominator is not going to be a technique that's going to help us. So let's look at this and see why we can't use any of the rules we have so far. All right, so now when I take a look at this one, I try to make u equal to the entire denominator, and I see that, oh, the problem is its derivative would only be an x, and this has an x squared plus x plus 1. Now, I could try to do the splitting thing, okay, where I split this into three different uh, integrals over the numerator. But even if I did that, I would have x squared over x squared plus 1 plus x over x squared plus 1 and then a 1 over x squared plus 1 dx. And you might be like, well, that looks like there's got some things that I can do, and it actually does. We know that we can work with this. This is an inverse tangent. This one is going to be a, power, a log rule substitution. I can let u equal the bottom and get the derivative in the top. This is the one that's causing me problems, that the degree is the same, and so it's a question of well, what can I do for this one in order to get this problem to work out for me. So what we're going to do is we're going to do long division. Okay? Um, and let's pause for a second and let's try to remind ourselves how do we do long division. Remember long division of polynomials, we're going to take a denominator and divide it into the numerator. And unfortunately, for a lot of these, your denominators are not going to be in a form that is going to allow us to use synthetic division. The, the short synthetic division only works when you have the divisor of the form x minus a. And unfortunately, we don't have that, so we're not going to be able to use synthetic here. Okay, so we're going to repeat the process on part B, and you might want to just put it on your own paper because, as we all know, I've not let you, left you enough room on the class notes. Uh, so we're going to do this problem, 
And again, how do I know that this is a problem where I might utilize the long division? Notice now the degree of the numerator is larger than the degree of the denominator. So clearly making any kind of a u substitution with the denominator is not going to work in this problem. You might also try to make a u substitution for the numerator. That's kind of like a, you know, not a bad thing necessarily, but if I look at the derivative here, I would need an x squared term, an x term, and a constant, and I don't have an x term down here. And you can't create an x term you don't have, so we know that we can't do a u substitution for either the bottom or the top. So then we say, oh, we need to transform this. We need to make this into a better form of a rational function than what I have. So we're going to use our long division. So I'm going to take my x squared plus 3. I'm going to divide that into the numerator. So x cubed minus 3x squared plus 4x minus 9. And just a reminder, if there are any terms that are missing in your dividend, you need to put in zeros. Uh, like a 0x or something if it wasn't one there, just so everything lines up nicely. So now we perform our long division uh, using our techniques from Algebra 2. x squared goes into x cubed, x times. So we end up with x cubed plus 3x. And again, I like to line it up where it goes. We are going to subtract. We end up with our negative 3x squared. Remember, we're subtracting 4 minus 3, so plus x minus 9. Notice I can keep going this time. So I, how many times does x squared go into negative 3x squared? Minus 3 times. So we multiply minus 3x squared plus 9. So put it over here. Put your parentheses. Remember, you are subtracting. These will cancel, so I end up with x and nothing else. And now once I get to here, I know that x squared is larger than x, so this is my remainder, my r of x. So I rewrite my integral with my fraction into its um, x squared plus 3 went into this. The whole number of times is the x minus 3 plus the fractional part, which is my remainder over my divisor. So I essentially get it into this form. And then, like I said, your whole part will always be polynomial, so those will be easy to integrate. And I kind of like to, instead of rewriting it multiple times, I just start integrating. The antiderivative of x is x squared, 1 half. Your antiderivative of minus 3 is minus 3x. And then when I get to the point where I need to do a little bit more work, I then write that one as, hey, I still need to do this integral. And this is a simple u substitution one. The degree of here is 1, the degree here is 2. So I can let u equal x squared plus 3. My du is going to be 2x. So I'm missing a constant. So I put it in and I take it out with a correction. And so I'm essentially integrating um, 1 over u du. So that's a log integration, my log rule. So I bring down the rest of it, 1 half x squared minus 3x, and I haven't put the plus c because I still hadn't finished this integration, but we do plus 1 half, remember this is 1 over u du, natural log absolute value of u plus c. And then we have finished out the integration for that one. So this last technique is your algebra method of long division. When do we use the algebra method of long division? When the either, okay, two options, the degree on the top is larger than the degree on the bottom, and there is not a derivative relationship between the two parts to so do a u substitution, or when the degrees are the same on the top and the bottom, I will use that uh, long division in that technique as well. All right, so to recap all of our algebra techniques that we are using in this section, we had long division, we had completing the square, uh, we had uh, completing the square several times, so that must come up a lot, and then we also had the idea that you could factor, 
and complete the square and then this partial fraction one which again we're really not worried about in the AB portion of the AP test that's more of a BC topic so I wouldn't worry so much about the partial fractions really concentrate on the factoring into a perfect square the completing the square to get the sum or difference of perfect squares and then our uh, technique of long division, long division. So those are the algebra techniques that you will need to practice for the AB portion of the AP.